from you. We're looking forward. Okay. Thank you, Morris, and the Birmingham Representative Council for inviting me to your commemoration and to speak about my family history, from which you will see that there's nothing new about the current cycle of hate against the Jews. May we have peace in Israel very soon. <laughs> By the way, Morris, it would appear that we're now slightly related, thanks to your two Mashadi brothers-in-law. My special thanks also to Lynn and Lawrence Julius of Harif, who are very kindly hosting this Zoom and helping with the technical side. Before I tell you about my family's history in Mashhad, I will give you a brief history of the Jews of Iran. I'm grateful to Dr. Aryan Esadjad at the Institute of Iranian Studies in Vienna for her help in educating me on the history of the Jews of Iran. So, is there a photo, the next photo please, for Lawrence of Iran map? With their presence in Iran dating back to the biblical era, Persian Jews constituted one of the oldest communities of the Jewish diaspora. The Assyrian king Shalmaneser conquered the kingdom of Israel and exiled part of the 10 tribes to areas now known as Western Persia, some 130 years prior to the destruction of the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar and the exiles of Babylon. Unlike the high literacy of the exiles of Babylon with their prolific documents, there were fewer historic records of the Ten Tribes era. Their story has often been transmitted orally from generation to generation. When Cyrus returned the Jews of Babylon to Jerusalem, some of the Jews remained and drifted to what is Iran today. Not only did they have the famous Jewish Queen Esther, but almost a century later, there was another Jewish queen, Shushan Docht. The oldest evidence of Jews from Iran is in Western China and Afghanistan. Gravestones and letters of Mashadi Jews were found in Bukhara and Afghanistan. The Jews lived a life marked by moments of great cultural achievement, followed by periods of great hardships, persecution, and even forced conversion. Lives of integration and segregation. Many Jews were small peddlers, but there were also individuals who became doctors or pharmacists who served at court and were highly revered by the monarchs. There were also famous writers, poets, and musicians. Those living in areas such as Mashhad were able to cross the border for trade along the Silk Road and prosper. In 1925, Reza Shah Pahlavi pushed back the influence of the Shia clergy and restrictions on the Jews and other religious minorities were abolished. However, as Reza Shah also pursued the policy of modern nationalism, Jewish schools, as other schools of minorities, were closed in the 1920s. Migration to Israel was from mid 19th century, followed by large scale migration after the establishment of the State of Israel. These were mostly Jews from low socioeconomic backgrounds, as they had little to lose and were hoping for a better life in Israel. In 1948, there were approximately 140 Jews in Iran. After 1953, the reign of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi brought the most prosperous era for Iran and its Jews, mainly due to oil prices. The majority of Iran's Jewish population emigrated in the aftermath of the revolution in 1979, of whom 
More than half went to the United States, others to Israel and Europe. As of 2007, Israel was home to some 100,000 Iranians. The US is home to some 80,000 Iranian Jews, most of whom have settled in the greater Los Angeles area and many Mashadi Jews in Great Neck, New York, and also Iranians in Baltimore and Maryland. In the Islamic Republic, Jews have become more religious and the synagogue became a focal point of their social lives. It became important, however, to differentiate between Jews and Israel and Zionism. The Jews currently living in Iran define themselves as Iranians or Jewish Iranians and refrain from any contact with Zionism or Israel due to crackdowns by the regimes. The Jewish schools are required to teach mainly in Farsi with fewer Hebrew texts. Some Jewish schools are required to remain open on Saturdays. Iranian Jews are allocated one seat in the Iranian parliament. In 2019, the Jewish population numbered 8,300 but there may be a few more who are not officially part of the community. Iranian Jews won't leave Iran because the international sanctions on Iran have so downgraded Iran's currency and value that they would see a massive drop in their standard of living. There is also, however, a constant fear to be accused of spying for Israel and thus they publicly distance themselves from Israel and Zionism to ensure their own security. So. Hey, Lawrence, can we have the first photo about the Mashad? So no luck with the music. Although there's a wider important history of the Jews of Mashad, today I want to focus on these three women and their faith and courage under the Chardin, the veil. The next map, please. I grew up hearing the experiences of my Orthodox Mashadi family who were hidden Jews in the Shiite Muslim city of Mashad in Northeast Iran. They proudly told of how they regularly duped the persecutors in order to survive and persevere and sorry, preserve their Jewish purity and strong Jewish identity, despite the edicts and pogroms inflicted on them. For five generations, my family, as well as their community, had to live a secret double life where they were outwardly Muslim yet secretly Jewish. They had to use Muslim names, attend mosque, wear miniature to fill in under their turbans, buy halal food, but all the while keeping shrita and kashrut. Child brides were betrothed as young as nine years with dual ktubas, one Muslim and one Jewish. These young brides were tasked with preserving Judaism in their homes, even during their husband's frequent business travels abroad. Mohels named babies with both Muslim and secret Jewish names, hidden synagogues in their homes, in the basement with tunnels linking the Jewish household, teaching the Torah and Siddur to their sons and devising a secret transliterated writing, Jadidi, Rashi script and Farsi words. They regularly had to pay bribes to governors, sheikhs and imams 
as well as police, to stop yet another pogrom. And although this story took place in the 19th and 20th centuries, at material level, they lived in conditions that were virtually medieval. They were called Jadid, Jadid al-Islam, the new Muslims. Though I knew all about this, nothing could have prepared me for my mother's short and powerful autobiography, handwritten in their secret Jadidi script. Can I have the next one, please? I discovered her writings during lockdown in a box file in my study and which I have translated into English and Hebrew. She wrote, I was 13 when I got married. At 14, I had children. At 40, I was widowed. They even married the daughters from the age of nine years old so that a Muslim man would not come and say, give your daughter to me. I want to tell you more about her story as well as that of my grandmother and my great-great-grandmother, three women who showed immense courage and determination in the face of daily life-threatening religious persecution. Next photo. My mother's ancestors were one of the first families brought to Mashhad in mid 18th century by Nadir Shah, a Sunni ruler. This large family were the Azizolayos who prospered in Mashhad. Shortly after their arrival, Nadir Shah was assassinated by the rival Shiite Muslims and the fortunes of the Jews changed for the worse. Considered unclean by the Muslims, the Jews from the outset were forced to live in a ghetto called Edgar. Next photo, please. In the shadow of the Imam's mosque by the city walls. Excluded from working and living inside Mashhad, many became merchants buying and selling to travelers from the Silk Route working in neighboring countries whilst leaving their wives and families for weeks, months, and sometimes years. In 1839, the al Dadi, a blood libel and pogrom erupted against the Jews, then numbering 2,400. Approximately 50 men, women, and children were killed, and the rest of the community were forced to convert to Islam or face death. The Imam even kidnapped six young Jewish girls as wives for his harem. When he died, two of them returned to the community. Those Jews who did not want the forced conversion fled to Herat in Sunni practicing Afghanistan. Some 20 years later, all Mashadi Jews living in Herat, the next map please, were taken prisoner by Persian troops for alleged treason. After a 20-day march in the snow, poorly dressed and poorly nourished, the survivors of that 400-kilometer journey were imprisoned for almost two years, forced to live with camels and horses in a dilapidated military inn called Baba Hodrat. Photo, please. Just outside the city walls, near the Jadidis, living just inside the, the walls of Mashhad, many of them related to each other. They were starving and cold and begging for food from outsiders. Eventually, the poverty-stricken Mashadi Jews raised sufficient funds to free them with a ransom to the governor. Among the survivors of the camp were my great-great-grandmother, Rahel Mashadeh I, and her husband, my great-great-grandfather, great Abdul Kohan, who were able to rejoin the Mashadi Jewish community. It was said that she was a descendant of the exiles of Israel. Rahel Mashadeh was widowed young, a single mother with a son, Netanel. 
She was a very radical and resourceful woman of her time, despite living in a patriarchal society. She was a beautician, a hairdresser, who sold fabrics and herbal medicines to the women as she went door to door. She made it her mission to teach and persuade the women to keep the faith, particularly those who had succumbed to Islam. While carrying out hairdressing and makeup on these women, she secretly taught them halachic rules of kashrut and dinim and persuaded them to teach their children against their husband's wishes and unbeknown to their husbands who had drifted away from Judaism. While Rahel dressed the brides, she was teaching them Jewish laws and kashrut and tahara. Gradually, she united the community. I've learned from several sources that my great-great-grandmother, who dared to tread where the Jewish men did not, was appointed as a community leader in charge of a charity responsible for collecting and distributing for those in need. Historians say that she became one of the most important influential figures, if not the most important, even more than the rabbis, in strengthening and preserving the community against assimilation. Next photo, please. My mother writes in her own words, I heard a lot about the deeds of Rahel Mashadela first. I did not see her, but I heard a lot about her, that she was one of the leaders of the Jewish community of Mashad. Many in government and municipal offices would respect her word. Every year as Pesach approached, they wanted to torch the Jewish homes and wipe out its inhabitants. She had friends and associates who would warn her she then prepared a very good gift containing one parcel of china, silver, oil, cookies, and things which in those days were valuable to take to the city governor. Once the rioting started, she was afraid to take the gifts alone. So three men dressed in full chador, the veil, as in those days, women had to wear chador, and they took the gifts with her and presented the gifts to the governor. She asked for many police as it was getting very bad in town. And the police went and blocked everyone. And then these three persons went back home. Rahel Mashadeva I bought land and its produce in partnership with Barbary Muslims. And once a year, the partner collected the produce and brought it to her. Everyone was amazed how she could have a partnership with the Barbaries and win their loyalty, but she was a great woman. My grandfather, Baba Abdul Cohen, was Rahel's orphan grandson whom she raised. And in my mother's account, she writes how Rahel Mashadeh I found him a wife. Next photo, please. She wasn't pretty, but she was also professor-like, like a doctor. Her name was also Rahel, and she too became known as Rahel Mashadeh II. Rahel Mashadeh II was, a, was not educated, but she made very many types of medicines. At home, she made iron pills, gold pills, cough pills, pills for acute pain, pills for stomachache, and people followed her instructions, also for women who could not conceive. For someone who did not want a baby, she showed contraception. She made cream with vegetables and oil and various powders. She prepared herself and everyone bought them from her. She put makeup on brides and made beautiful henna patterns. She spent three days with each bride and worked very hard. She delivered 300 babies. Even Muslims knew about her and would come for her. But although she did not like to go, she said, it would be a sin if I don't go. 
She would first ask for signed papers as she was not a doctor, and if it was not a normal delivery, she would not stay. But everyone was always very satisfied with her. They would come for her and she would inoculate the babies. She was very clean and very pious. She made a secret synagogue in the basement, hidden from the Muslims. She looked after the synagogue and worked for the community. She was careful and took care that the children would not see it until they got older, so as not to tell anyone. When they got older, she could explain to them, and only then they started going to synagogue. My mother continues. My mother-in-law, Rahel Mashadeh II, helped to wash the dead and dress them. There was a time when people were afraid to see the shroud or to sew it or to go near a dead person. The work of the community became very hard. This Rahel Mashadeh bought a shroud and invited some of the women and some young ones and some newlyweds and told them to come and learn as there's nothing to fear. It's like any other clothing that you cut or you sew. She said, the dead don't bother anyone. No one should be afraid to go to a levaya and help. It is a mitzvah. From then on, people were reassured and she, while she was alive, would help. My late brother, Eli, told us that he was always with his Bibi Rahel. She took him with other grandchildren to the fields to pick the herbs and flowers, as well as poppies for her pills, after which he slept really well. When Bibi Rahel decided to leave for Jerusalem with her orphan granddaughters, he, aged 10, insisted that she take him with her, which she reluctantly agreed. So this is the life that my mother Rivka Haji Bibi came from. She did not hold an official role in the community like her ancestors, but lived with Rahel Mashadeh II since the age of 13 as a child bride. She admired her greatly and was greatly influenced by her. My mother was a teenager with her babies but devoutly preserving Judaism under persecution. Her own resilience, faith, and determination showed equal amounts of courage in the face of her life situation. In her own words, My name is Haji Bibi. I was born in Iran and got married there. My father was a Levi. My mother was a, my husband was a Cohen. My mother had 14 children, but only six of us survived. She died in childhood. One, sorry, six died in childhood. One got burned, one fell off the roof of the building and the others became ill. I myself was a mother of eight children of whom six survived. Uh, next picture, please the wedding dresses. The, these are her red wedding dress, a blue Sheva Brachot dress, and a double identity necklace with stars of David and Islamic crescent moon. Her words continue. I was 13 when I got married. I was considered an old maid. At 14, I had children. At 40, I was widowed. It was very hard. I experienced much wandering from place to place, always a child in my arms. There were no push chairs or prams and no help. I did all the laundry by hand. When the children were older, we came to London and washing machines came into the world. Fridges came, ovens to cook food. We lived in Bombay for 10 years without a fridge, cooker or washing machine. Now in my life, I look at the easy life and I'm upset that I was born too soon. Oh, well. Can I have the next photo, please? 
there were no public schools in Mashhad at the time of her childhood, and the Bate Midrash were only for boys. Although girls were not allowed to read and write, literacy was very important for my mother. She writes of her education prior to her marriage at 13. They did not send the girls to school to avoid any non-Jew taking them. I was very keen to learn to write. One of my aunts could read and write a little. She was very educated. She said, if you babysit in my home, I will teach you. She alone gave me pen and paper and taught me the Aleph Bet. I slowly persevered with reading and writing and connected the letters until I learned it. This was a great boost for me. I learned the Siddur and Torah by myself. Someone taught me to read the Muslim Persian writing, but I could not write it. My mother, who subsequently lived in India, Israel, and London, spoke Farsi, Hindustani, Hebrew, and English, as well as reading an English newspaper. My mother writes about Iran. The next photo, please. My father was a Rav, a Mohel, a Shochet, but he never accepted money from anyone. He always did communal work and did mitzvot. He read the Torah and gave Kiddush. The Shechita had to be done in hiding. He would go to the basement where there was soil. He would slaughter and cut and wrap in a cloth and then distribute. If it was lamb, he would go to the person's house to slaughter it. They told everyone they were Muslims, but we observed all the Jewish re religious laws very well and still do. A few people would go and buy non-kosher meat and brought it home to show that we were all the same as everyone else. They would then chuck it in the toilet. Once a year at the onset of winter, we slaughtered one or two sheep which we stewed and we would eat its fat for six months. In Iran, there were no water pipes. We drew up water by hand from a well. There was no electricity, there was no heating. We used coal or wood or cow dung or sheep dung, which was dried and then burnt. The next photo, please. Each family had eight or nine children, and we always liked each other and looked after each other, just like a kibbutz. My mother continues about the festivals. We bake the matzot at home for the whole community, but Rahel did not allow matzot to be taken out of the door in daylight. Over a period, small amounts were wrapped and one by one, they would come at night to collect it under each other. For Yom Kippur, my father-in-law made a large Kippur candle by hand for the synagogue. They blew the shofar in a back room with a curtain across its door so that no sound would reach out to the street. We had to be very careful with the synagogue. We were not allowed to bring small children in case they talked about it when they were outside. And I have the next photo, please. We were three households and we all had several children. When the children were small, they told us to take them upstairs and keep them quiet. On slichot nights, if anyone came from a distance, they would offer him a place to sleep so that at dawn, the police would not stop them and ask where they were going. They did a lot of mitzvot. They always taught us and repeatedly told us to help with our hands, feet, and our money and our eyes, and to always do good, always walk the good path. So what became of them? Next photo, please. Well, the Jews of Mashhad all loved Jerusalem and Israel, 
and my maternal Azizullah grandparents and their families moved to Jerusalem in approximately 1925, where they lived in the Bukharian quarter in a house built in the Persian style. Their relatives also built two synagogues nearby, all still exist today. My grandmother, Rahel Mashadeh II, traveled overland to British Mandate Palestine via Damascus in her 70s with three young children noted on her passport as her own children. She lived in Jerusalem, close to the Azizalayov, my maternal grandparents. My mother wrote of this. When she got very old, in 1935, she decided to go to Israel, then Palestine. She took three grandchildren with her. She told everyone, you should all start coming, but it didn't happen. War started in Israel and this poor lady was always afraid that the dead could not be buried for a week or 10 days. She was afraid that the same would happen to her if she died. They said the bombs stopped and this lady was not ill, but one day she would not eat anything she was offered. She said she had a stomachache. She died in her sleep. That day, there were no bombs and they took her and 13 other dead, said the prayers and buried them. Next photo, please. A couple of years after her mother-in-law left for Palestine, my mother, Rivka Hajibibi, now aged 28, ventured on her own road trip to join her husband in Bombay, whom she had not seen for five years. She traveled with three young children aged between 10 and three. They traveled overland, leaving the city by a horse and cart and then along the Afghan border in a freight lorry. My mother and my sister Malka traveled in front with the driver. Danny and little Aaron on the back of the lorry among the freight bundles, accompanied by a Jewish youth looking after them. Next photo, please. Some 1,000 kilometers later, my father was waiting for them on the roadside at Quetta, then India before partition. Danny and Aaron did not remember their father at all. Next photo, please. My brother Matt and I were born in Bombay. Next photo, please. <laughs> this is my father and his mother in Jerusalem. My father died just before Pesach in 1948, and his mother, Rahel Mashadeh, died in Jerusalem just after Pesach on the eve of Israel's independence, within a couple of months of each other. Although I was five when he died, I was strengthened and sustained by my mother and the entire family's love and care and devotion for each other, as well as unconditional faith in Hashem and strong Jewish identity. My mother relished her freedom to freely practice her Jewish faith. She took pride in laying the Shabbat table early, sometimes on Thursday, and putting out the Shabbat candles in the candlesticks. She told us the story that in Mashad, they were frequently raided by police, either on Friday night or at Havdalah or festivals, <clears throat> looking for the forbidden wine, which they secretly made at home. One night, the police arrived in her home, she quickly emptied the wine cup in a bucket of water <clears throat> and hid the bottle in her baby's crib under the blanket. It's ironic that now my brother Matt Haruni is the founder of Dalton Winery in Israel. <clears throat> I now know my ancestors have won. My ancestors, together with my mother, have left an incredible dynasty and legacy of which I'm proud and blessed to be a descendant. Next photo, please. 
And finally, one source wrote of the two Rahels, and I include my mother in this. It was the faith, care, and perseverance that these lionesses showed, which have continued to be the role models in our households. It is appropriate to mention their names as the mothers of the community. May their memories be blessed. And I have the first picture again, and any music. Thank you. Thank you. Still there. Did you hear the music? No. <laughs> I go back to the opening slide. Okay. How do I get to full screen? Okay. Shall I close the slides? Yes, close. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Right. Okay. And shall I add the audience as well? I'll share the screen with you and the audience now. Thank you. Um, where's the audience? Face the other way, Ruth. Should be able to. Okay, yeah, you've got the two spotlights. One is the audience, and one is your good self. I don't know what Michael wants to do, and you want to do for now, Rachel. Yes. I'm waiting for them. I'm not doing anything. I've finished. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there are questions, which I, which I might be able to ask. So Rachel, I think you should be able to hear us now. Yes. Okay, Ruth. So, yeah. so this, this is me, Rachel. Ruth, Ruth we met on Thursday. Or Sorry. Can you get nearer? I can't hear you. Ruth, you need to come over here. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth. you need to come over here. You need to come over here. <laughs> so if, you just stand, if you just stand there and speak, Ruth, it'll be perfect. Can you see me now? She can hear you. Well, you don't have to see me. It's not such a big deal. But... Your talk has been incredible. Um, I, I'm so struck by the fact that we don't have enough opportunity to, um, to hear about the extraordinary people from who you, from your ancestors. As, as European Jews, most of us here in this community, we know a lot more about our European ancestors Having heard this this afternoon, it's quite incredible as to what you what you shared with us and the, and the strength and resilience of your family. I can't get over the thought that you might have walked, or well, you didn't, but your 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 mother had walked all that way to Quetta and then to Bombay. It, quite quite incredible. I, I think that your talk has for, for all of us has highlighted. A special part of our history and even though it's not quite our history I feel I want it to be part of my history and I'm going to go and find some books to read about the Jews of Iran in Mashhad but I want to thank you so much for putting this presentation together and for giving it for us. We, have, we are one of the very few communities outside of London that has this annual commemoration and in a way, the reason we do this is because I feel it's really important for the people in our community who have come from these countries in the Middle East to feel that they could have their history remembered. And that's why we do it. And that's all being well, I hope we'll continue to do it for many years ahead. Your story has been very inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Hey, Rich, can I ask one question? Do you have any family left in Iran today? No. No, we don't. I think uh, mostly there's no Jews in Mashhad. Uh, most, they're mostly in Tehran. I'm not aware of any Mashadi Jews there anywhere. Nin? I just wanted to say it's wonderful that you in Birmingham are doing this commemoration. As Ruth said, 
Uh, you are one of the few communities outside London who do this every year. And we really appreciate it here at Harif because what we would write, like to see is for every synagogue, every community to do this commemoration. Um, you know, maybe you, you can start a trend. <laughs> Just to say, I'm so appreciative. Thank you so much. Lynn, we've done it for quite a number of years now. I know and, you have. Uh, it's yes. good when you came to talk here as well. And we haven't forgotten that. But thank you so much for thinking, for thanking us. But really, I think we owe a great deal of gratitude to, to the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Lawrence and Julia, yeah. Lawrence and Lynn. Without you, this couldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I circulated family and friends. I know there, I can see them in Israel. I know that New York might have been joining and also in London. So thank you for bringing us together. You had about 90 people online, we're now down to 79, but we had about 90 here and you said 40 in the hall. So that's 120, 130 people, which is pretty wow. important. Well, it's a story that needs to be told. And I feel passionately about it. Great. Okay, should I close down the Zoom session now? Do you want me to keep it going for the rest of the evening? Uh, I don't know if people want to ask any questions or not. There are messages coming in, but I can't see all of them. You want us to read them to you? Let's get um, them. Yeah. Well, I can read them. Lots of thank yous, which I won't go through. No. Some saw their mother, Esther Aziz uh, Easter as Aziz Salaf Elisha yeah. on the picture. Right. By 1950, Umar Shadi Jewry had left for Tehran, and there was an exodus again after the revolution to London, US, M Milan, and Israel. That's from Mehran. Yes. And most of Mashadi Jews are in uh, Great Neck, New York. Yes. No, we've, we've, met, we've met half of them. My sister used to live there. <laughs> Two very good Persian restaurants, I remember. <laughs> Well, actually, I we went to a Bukharian rest, kosher Bukharian restaurant in Vienna. Would you believe, of all places, when we went to see Ariane, right. who couldn't be here. Right. Um, there are lots of Bukharian Jews in Vienna who they left during the Soviet Union days. And someone's asked, is there a recording? Yes, there is a recording. I will send it to Birmingham. Morris. Sorry, to Morris. Mor Morris after the event, and I'll leave Morris to publicize it. But uh, we have the recording. Can I have a copy as well, please? Of course. <laughs> it's still recording so now, so still be careful what you say. <laughs> I'll send it to the hurry mailing list anyway. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for us. We uh, Both of us have thoroughly enjoyed the talk. Good, good. But that's how I learned about Lynn's past when I listened to these. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I've learned a lot, Rachel. I think it was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Well, I think <laughs> if no one has questions, we can, whatever they want to do in Birmingham, it's up to them. Okay. I'm stopping recording now. And thank you, everyone.